assalamu alaikum hello um, i'm dr bia salman and uh, today i'm going to talk about uh, antenatal care or prenatal care antenatal or prenatal care jo hai wo why it's given it's actually the care given to a woman during pregnancy to achieve a healthy mother and a healthy baby um it's uh, throughout the pregnancy uh you look after the patient and uh, you identify any risk factors things like that so for that uh, that period of time uh, it's called antenatal care or prenatal care so who can provide the care this care of of course a doctor it could be a family physician or an obstetrician or it could be a nurse there are nurses that specialize in this field so they can also provide an also midwife in the west um in canada america and in the uk midwives do take care of patients pregnant patients and provide good care to them so it can be given by any of these three what are the goals goals of antenatal care is of course first of all you have to diagnose the pregnancy uh which you will obviously do on the at the first visit and you will estimate the gestational age because it it is possible that the patient uh comes to you at a later stage you know it's it's uh it's not uh likely for every patient to be presenting you know uh just initially you know at for uh, four weeks or six weeks it it is highly possible that the patient comes to you when she's like 36 weeks pre- pregnant uh, that is also so you have to know at whatever stage the patient is coming you have to know the gestational age of the patient so basic goals are that you have to make sure that you identify or any potential complications and you identify high risk pregnancies patients who are at high risk for example if there's a patient who is at risk of preeclampsia so or if someone had um, abortions previously his history of two or three abortions so you have to identify those patients high risk patients and provide them with the good care then uh, of course you have to uh, make sure that the health of the mother and the baby are well well taken care of they are in good condition and then um, any problems you can anticipate any problems for example you're checking the blood pressure of the patient at every visit so if if it's a little off or something you can just um, monitor that you can just monitor that and take care of that in a timely fashion and that will definitely prevent and minimize morbidity uh and one other goal and a very important goal is to educate the patient and communicate with the patient you have to counsel the patient educate them about uh their pregnancy what the changes they are going going to go through during this time period so these are the goals you have to ensure the health of the mother and the baby the main goal is that next the visits how many visits so initially you see the patient every 4 weeks that is until like once you know that uh, a patient is pregnant from that time until 28 weeks uh, of the pregnancy you are going to schedule visits every 4 weeks after that you are going to uh, see the patient twice a week uh, twice uh, a month like every 2 weeks from 28 weeks till 36 weeks and then after 30 weeks 36 weeks you will be seeing the patient every week so the later the pregnancy uh, is going to be uh, the later stages you are going to see the patient more frequently next is um, let's start with the initial prenatal visit so the initial prenatal visit usually it uh, happens within 8 to 12 weeks 
you know, the patient comes to you, you know, telling that uh, I've missed my period. And then you have to obviously make sure you have to confirm the pregnancy first of all. So, and um, after that, uh, if, if you know that, because some patients, um, they plan, they plan their pregnancy mostly now because there is awareness and everything, the people plan. So if the patient comes to you that she wants to get pregnant, so you have to start your care from that visit. You have to counsel the patient, educate the patient, tell her what she needs to do. Then uh, uh, first, usually you will schedule eight to 12 weeks. And then um, if the patient is... Uh, uh, you can schedule earlier, you know, if there's, if the patient is less than 20 years of age or she's over 35 years of age or there's any bleeding or she's very nauseous or there are other risk factors. So you can schedule according to that. Then first trimester, let's talk about the first trimester, um, which is uh, the last uh, menstrual period, the first uh, day of the last menstrual period to the time till 12 weeks. The first 12 weeks of pregnancy um, are the first trimester. And uh, obviously you're gonna take a good history. A good history can tell you a lot of things. It's very important to take a good history because uh, it can, you can, uh, you can um, know the risk factors. You can identify a lot of things. You can identify high risk pregnancies just through a good history. So you will uh, ask about the obstetric history uh, previous pregnancies, how many pregnancies, were, were there any complications, what was the duration, you know, whether it was preterm or post-term or term pregnancies, what was the outcome, stillbirth, normal life fetus, all those questions you're going to ask, how was the perinatal course, how was the pregnancy throughout, and how was, how were the previous deliveries, were there any complications during the deliveries, and their modes, mode of delivery is very important because, uh, um, if the patient uh, has uh, a history of one previous cesarean section, then you can go for um, a normal vaginal delivery in the second second pregnancy. But if she has um, a history of two previous cesarean sections, then you're most likely going to um, be having another cesarean for her. So. The mode is important. Ask about that. Ask uh, all um, all these questions. Then gynecologic history, the menstrual cycle, length, pattern, sexual history is important. You know, multiple partners. You have to ask if there's increased risk of uh, STIs, sexually transmitted diseases. So you'll ask about that that as well. Then past medical history, any chronic illnesses to the patient, for example, she has hypertension or something, she's taking any medications or not, ask all those things. Family history is important. Is there um, any history of any inherited uh, conditions in the family? You know, ask about hypertension, diabetes, you know, uh, cancer histories, all, all relevant history. Um, ask about that. Sometimes thalassemia runs in families. So all those risk factors you can evaluate through asking um, about family history. Then social and lifestyle history. Uh, you have to ask about drugs and alcohol, you know, whether the patient is taking or not. It's very important. Um, alcohol, you know, no amount of alcohol is safe in pregnancy. So it's very important that you counsel the patient about that and ask this question. Um, how is the support structure? How the patient is financially, she's married or not, whether she's a single mother, like the conditions of the house, just so you know that she has the emotional and emotional and psychological support because pregnancy is a very vulnerable time. These, you just, uh, by asking these questions, you just uh, uh, try to assess the condition of the patient, whether she's in a safe and a healthy environment or not. Uh, you have to ask about spousal abuse for sure, because pregnancy, pregnant women are most vulnerable uh, to abuse. So do ask about spousal abuse as well. 
teratogenic exposures, um, exposure to x-rays, any toxins, chemicals, or some um, prescription drugs as well, because, for example, lithium is the drug that is you know, harmful in pregnancy. So uh, ask about the medication history as well. Uh, this, a good history, will give you a good picture about uh, how you're going to take care of the patient in the coming weeks. Next is, uh, yeah, after history, the physical exam, you have to do the exam. The initial exam will give you a baseline idea of her health condition, will give you a baseline impression, and uh, uh, which you can obviously compare uh, in, uh, in the future. You, for example, the important elements I've mentioned, BMI. BMI is very important uh, to be taken at the beginning, the weight of the patient, you know, uh, the patient is going to gain weight. So how will you know whether she's gain, gaining uh, the appropriate weight or not? You have to uh, uh, have her BMI at the initial visit and you'll be comparing the weight, the weight gain according to that BMI, the initial one that you took, that will tell you whether she's gaining the appropriate weight or not. Then blood pressure, blood pressure reading you need, do a pelvic exam, thyroid exam, breast exam, and skin skin condition. A lot of um, uh, diseases show up on the skin as well. So look at the, you know, an overall, overall condition of the patient, check her skin and everything. After that, uh, labs. Labs, uh, these are the labs, baseline labs. You have to do uh, complete blood count, blood grouping, antibody screen, HBV screen, STD screen, you know, you have to screen for all the uh, sexually transmitted diseases, ask uh, in the history as well, and then test for it as well. Uh, urine analysis and culture, and then uh, pap smear. Pap smear, of course, if the patient uh, uh, has no no history of pap uh, smear in the past two years. If she hasn't had a pap smear, then you offer one, and that's how it's done. If she has a pap smear, you know, uh, like she had, she says, "I had one done two months ago," so there's no need to do another pap smear then. Okay, so complete blood count. Complete blood count, you'll see at the hemo, you will look at the hemoglobin and hematocrit. Uh, why? Because of course you need to evaluate for anemia. It could be pre-existing and, uh, and it could arise during the pregnancy as well. So look at the hemoglobin, the hematocrit, the MCV, that is the mean corpuscular volume. Uh, if it's low, that shows that uh, the patient has microcytic anemia and microcytic anemia, if this comes low, if this value is low, then you have to obtain iron studies. Why? Because iron deficiency anemia is the most common cause of microcytic anemia. So iron studies you will do if you see a microcytic picture on complete blood count. Iron studies, the serum ferritin, total iron binding capacity, all those tests, then you'll go for them. Then platelets and WBC count, of course, platelets look for thrombocytopenias or related conditions. And then WBC count, um, of course, will let you know if there's any infection or not. <clears throat> Sorry. So then blood type, get the blood type, get her uh, blood group. You need to know the blood group, the RH factor, whether it's RH positive or negative, and then the atypical antibody test. So RH negative women, um, are at increased risk of uh, maternal fetal NTD iso immunization, and they should be tested for the presence of NTD antibodies via the ATT. If the patient uh, is RH negative, then you'll do the A AT test, NTD antibody test, uh, because you know if the mother is RH negative, the fetus is RH positive. So the, if the mother is exposed to the fetal antigens, then the body will react and it could cause hemolysis. So it's very important that you test for this. The presence of atypical antibodies indicates that the fetus is at risk of isoimmunization, of course. 
then then rubella and varicella igg this is another test that you have to do and uh, most women are usually uh, rubella igg positive uh, of past immunization or exposure so if a patient is positive it's a good thing you know patients get oh i'm positive you know patient can get really um uh, worried about oh positive for a virus so it's a good thing if it's positive we are looking for a positive result that means that the patient is uh, immunized uh the rubella vaccine and the varicella vaccine they are live vaccines and are, and are not safe during pregnancy so they are contraindicated and the, here i have listed some of the safe and the unsafe vaccines you should know about them they can come up in exam so uh, keep these in mind then the hbv screen hepatitis b virus screen you have to do this uh, they sh all women should be screened for hbv uh, hbv even if they have been immunized even they say yeah we are immunized the patient is giving the history that i have had the vaccine but still you have to screen for it because uh, there exists a possibility of exposure prior to immunization and if the patient comes positive the hbs antigen comes positive what you have to do oh what you have to do is um, you'll do the lfts and lfts and then uh, him uh, uh, hb immunoglobulin hepatitis b immunoglobulin you have to give to the baby after birth then your analysis culture of do you have to have a baseline assessment of the renal function of the patient because in during pregnancy there is an increased risk of uh, asymptomatic bacteria patient may be symptomless and there will be uh, an infection going on and uh, asymptomatic bacteria if it shows up you have to immediately treat it with antibiotics because why because there is increased risk of uti and pyelonephritis during pregnancy so treat it immediately with antibiotics Mm, now for trimester the common complaints what you'll hear are breast enlargement and tenderness nausea vomiting morning sickness fatigue uh, for this these are all basically normal normal changes you know enlargement and tenderness you just have to counsel the patient regarding this nausea vomiting there are uh, uh, you can uh, tell them about strategies about eating frequently and you know having crackers not uh, staying on an empty stomach the uh, morning sickness vomiting nausea these are also these are all going to happen if it's severe then you go for medication otherwise you counsel the patient and give her uh, strategies how to cope with that fatigue it's very common you, you just uh, tell the patient to rest gingival bleeding yes it it can occur during first trimester even second trimester throughout the pregnancy it can happen because because of increased uh, uh, blood flow and also hormonal changes that can happen just uh, they need a good the patient if the patient is coming with this you have to tell them to have a good uh, dental hygiene and that's it migraine like headaches they can occur just uh, if they are severe then you can prescribe acetaminophen otherwise uh, uh, just try to cope with it you know with mm, other remedies resting and things like that dizziness can happen spotting bleeding can occur and it occurs in 20% of pregnancies and uh, it's okay a little bit of spotting can occur it's okay you do monitor that but 50% of the pregnancies with initial spotting they progress normally and what complication can happen during the first trimester that is the spontaneous abortion that can happen you know within the first 12 weeks second trimester visit um 
uh, norm elements I'm going to talk about first, improved sense of well-being. The nausea and vomiting usually gets better by the second trimester. The patient feels better, but there is uh, there could be mild pelvic pain. The patient can start to feel the fetal movements, which is called quickening. So for pr primary gravida, first-time mothers, it's 18 to 20 weeks. Uh, it's It occurs about 18 to 20 weeks. And then for multigravidas, it can occur uh, as early as 16 weeks. A patient can have uh, uh, contractions, just uh, uh, false contractions, not just Braxton Hicks contractions, not actual labor contractions. Um, then uh, the average gain, weight gain in, in the second trimester is uh, about one pound per week. So the two routine tests that are done are triple or quad screen and the fetal anomaly ultrasound. Now, common complaints. The common complaints um, during the second trimester could be mid pelvic pain. Uh, it basically occurs because you know the size of the uterus is growing, is uh, uh, growing, and the patient feels you know that some like I have pain or something. It's just the pains of it could, of the growing uterus. Back pain, of course, your uh, the baby is growing, you're carrying weight all the time, so back pain can occur. You have to uh, tell patient to rest and, uh, you know, use uh, some kind of uh, um, heating pads, anything to soothe out the pain. Um, then ongoing breast pain, of course, the breaths, gr uh, breast enlargement also occurs, so it could also happen. Unwanted hair growth, can occur because pregnancy is a time, you know, hormones, uh, le hormonal levels are changing. So patients can present with, you know, unwanted hair growth. It actually uh, settles down once the baby is born and the pregnancy is over. Skin changes, stretch marks can appear, increased pigmentation um, can happen uh, during pregnancy. Then hemorrhoids, the, uh, the can occur because uh, the plate of the fetus, the, the baby is sitting on the rectum and things get slower. So constipation occurs. And when constipation occurs, hemorrhoids can happen. So you have to uh, counsel the patient about, you know, increased fiber intake, uh, a proper diet, which could prevent uh, constipation and then hence uh, hemorrhoids as well. Complications, uh, what could be the complications that can happen? Cervical insufficiency can occur during this uh, time period. Premature preterm rupture of membranes and preterm labor can occur. Uh, preterm labor that is, you know, after 20 weeks and before 37 weeks, if uh, labor occurs, that is preterm labor. So it can happen uh, during the second trimester. Uh, you have to advise the patient to see a doctor immediately if there is vaginal bleeding, severe cramping, fever, or dysuria, any of those things, and just ask the patient to see a doctor immediately. Next is the ultrasound screening. That's, uh, that's what is done um, uh, in the second trimester. You can do an ultrasound in the first trimester as well to just to confirm the pregnancy and see the fetal heartbeat and everything, whether it's an intrauterine pregnancy or, uh, or not. All those things, it's done uh, at that time too. But uh, in the second trimester, uh, at eight to 12 weeks, um, yeah, I'm gonna tell one by one uh, when it's done. Uh, so eight to 12 weeks, uh, uh, ultrasound. It's what well, it's called the dating ultrasound. It's usually done for dating, uh, just to uh, if the patient is not sure of her last menstrual, the date of her last menstrual period, then uh, for co confirmation or even if to just match the dates that she told you to uh, just confirm and see the accuracy. You have to do this scan at this time. Uh, eight to 12 weeks. And then 11 to 14 weeks, you do an ultrasound for nuchal translu uh, translucency. Uh, it's also called the first trimester screen. You screen for trisomy uh, 21. It's, uh, it's for basically for neural tube defects. 
you screen for neural tube defects for this ultrasound. 18 to 20 weeks, um, they, you do another ultrasound, uh, which is basically the anatomy scan. And you see the growth and the anatomy, you see all the organs, everything, all the parts, limbs, head, neck, everything is uh, good. The, all the organs have been formed, all uh, organ systems you check in this ultrasound. So 18 to 20 weeks, it's a very important scan. Then earlier or subsequent ultrasounds can be performed if there is an indication. So basically you do three ultrasounds, but you can do more. Uh, if there is an indication. Prenatal screening investigations, yeah. These are very, very important. Uh, um, if uh, I tell you test case, up, say, these are important. First trimester screen, uh, combined test. For between 11 to 14 weeks, it's done. Uh, Pregnancy-associated plasma. Three combined tests, uh, is made three things you test. Um, this pregnancy associated plasma protein, you take a blood sample for this, you take a blood sample for beta HCG, and you do an ultrasound scan. These three things you do, it's called a combined test. It it is done between 11 to 14 weeks. Uh, important to know, keep this in mind. Then maternal serum screen. That is the second screening that is done. It's also called the quadruple test performed. It's performed between 15 to 20 weeks. It's uh, that is during the second trimester. So quadruple test, you have you're testing four things. Alpha fetoprotein, this is AFP, estriol, HCG, and inhibin A. You're uh, taking a serum sample, blood sample, and you're looking for these four things, the levels of these four things, it's going to tell you if the patient is at risk of having trisomy 21. Integrated prenatal screen. This is the third screening. Uh, it is done. Uh, it's like, it's the screening that is done that I've told you already about. It's like combines, it's all the screening that is done during the pregnancy, like 11 to 13 weeks, you're doing the ultrasound uh, for nuchal translucency. And at 11 to 14 weeks, you're doing this, first, uh, this, uh, first trimester screen. This screen, this screen, and uh, you're doing this. All of these combined is the integrated prenatal screen. Uh, after that, uh, this is a, a good chart of the quad screen, which I just wanted to mention. Uh, four things you test on the quad screen, AFP, estriol, um, uh, HCG levels and inhibin A. So this is a chart, you can go through this chart um, and it's uh, like for if the patient has Down syndrome, so these two things, uh, HCG will be high and inhibin A will be high. You have to kind of memorize it uh, to remember it. And uh, this, these are the things like uh, kind of mnemonic kind of a thing, uh, which will help you remember that what values you have to see and what what is the anomaly you will look for. So if it's HCG and inhibin A are very high and the AFP and estriol are low, you would think Turner syndrome. If um, inhibin A and AFP, if the estriol and HCG are low, you will think Edward. For the Down syndrome, AFP and estriol are low and the HCG and inhibin A are high. So these are the values you need to remember. And if the isolated elevation of AFP, that means uh, Patau syndrome. So these values are indicative of the syndrome that you're looking for, that you're screening for. Next is, uh, yeah, these are the invasive diagnostic tests. Two of the tests are done, amniocentesis and chorionic villus sampling. It amniocentesis, you take, uh, it's like ultrasound guided trans abdominal extraction of amniotic fluid. Uh, you take out amniotic fluid and test it. And it is performed between 15 to 16 weeks of pregnancy. 
it is uh, both these tests are used for confirmation of uh, the screening test. Like if the screening test is showing you uh, positivity for Down syndrome, so these are the tests you can offer the patient for confirmation of that. These are quite accurate, but of course there are chances of failure. And uh, because they're invasive, uh, there is a chance of fetal loss as well. Chorionic villus sampling, it's the biopsy of fetal derived chorion, and it is performed between 10 to 12 weeks. This is important to know when, which test is performed when. Amniocentesis is 15 to 16 weeks, babe, and chorionic uh, villus sampling, CVS at 10 to 12 weeks. Then third trimester, uh, visit what you're going to do, what's the purpose of third trimester, monitor fetal growth, position, well-being. Same thing, you were doing that in the first two trimesters as well, but now you're going to do it more because the baby has grown and you've come a long way, the patient has come a long way. So uh, you will look for fetal heart tones, uh, fundal height measurement, you can uh, measure the fundal height. It, will, it tells you... Um, it tells you like uh, whether um, the fundal height is uh, there is coinciding with uh, the gestational age, the weeks that the patient is in. And then Leopold maneuvers. These are the maneuvers you check, uh, you do to check the position of the fetus, where the head is, you know, where the baby bum is, what position the baby is lying. You just uh, uh, do these maneuvers to check that. Advanced tests uh, for fetal growth position and well-being are non-stress test and biophysical profile. These two tests are done in the third trimester. I'll talk about them later. Monitor for maternal complications. Of course, you have to keep checking maternal uh, blood pressure because uh, to check for preeclampsia, because this is the time when preeclampsia can occur. Screening for gestational diabetes, it is done at 24 to 28 weeks. This is important to know when, uh, when do you screen for gestational diabetes? Uh, that is at 24 to 28 weeks. You offer the patient for the um, screening for gestational diabetes. Then CBC again to detect gestational anemia. Now the patient is in her third trimester, you know, baby is all grown, baby needs more iron, so patient can get anemic in this period. Check for that. Uh, this is group B streptococcus culture uh, screening. It is done at 36 weeks. Um, you must know when it's done. Uh, it's, uh, it's important to do this screening because uh, it can cause, you know, infection in the fetus. So screen for this. Next is non-stress test. This is the non-stress test. In this test, you uh, look at the fetal heartbeat. You know, this is the fetal heart rate, how the heart, the normal fetal heart rate is 110 to 160. That is the normal range. So if it's coming, you know, at 150, then it's normal. And these are called accelerations. These are accelerations. This is um, this is showing uh, it's good. The, there should be accelerations. And this is the baby movement. It, it tells you all these things. And it can also tell you about uterine contractions. But uh, there should be no contractions, you know. Because uh, if there are contractions, then the, ba the ba patient is in labor and we don't want that before time. So the non-stress test is done to check for all these things. Then uh, the labs. What are the labs? I, the labs, I gave you an idea what labs you're going to do. Again, you're going to do your analysis for glycosuria and proteinuria. Glycosuria, because if the patient is, has developed diabetes or is was diabetic so you have to check for this glucose in the urine and proteinuria because proteinuria is a sign of preeclampsia because the patient is having protein in her uh, uh, urine uh, along with a high bp then it's preeclampsia so check for that these things then cbc again you have to do 24 to 28 weeks check for hemoglobin if it's less than 10 it is considered anemia in a pregnant patient. Okay, then oral glucose tolerance test is done. I told you it's between 24 to 28 weeks. 
uh, two types of tests are offered, one hour 50 gram uh, uh, OGTT and three hour 100 gram. It's like uh, you patient is given 50 grams of uh, glucose uh, says given and then you check, you know, one hour and then three hours and this is the procedure. So these are done for screening. Uh, you should know about these. Then AAT, uh, atypical antibody test, 28 weeks. It's done at 28 weeks. Patients who are RH negative and uh, AAT negative should be given a rogue gamma at 28 weeks. Okay, so patient is RH negative, you, you do the AAT test, a antibody test. If it's negative, then you give the rogue gamma. If it's positive, there's no need to give the rogue gamma. Okay, GBS, 36 weeks. That's the group B streptococcal uh, screening test that is done. It's at done 30, uh, It's done at uh, 36 weeks and with vaginal and rectal swabs are taken and they're cultured. If the patient uh, is positive for GBS skin, so you have to give IV penicillin during labor because uh, there is a risk of transmission, vertical transmission to the fetus during delivery, during labor. So give the patient IV penicillin G for this if the patient is positive. These are all the labs for the third trimester. Next is the common events. What are the common events that happen during the third trimester? During the final several weeks of pregnancy, obviously the uh, fetus is going to move into the presenting position, which uh, can be detected by the Leopold maneuvers. You can check by, you know, uh, doing the maneuvers, and you can check just by. Uh, doing the abdominal examination, which uh, the, whether the position uh, is uh, breech or normal. Then ultrasound may be performed at 35 to 36 weeks to confirm the position. For the confirmation of position, this ultrasound can be done. External cephalic version may be performed at 37 to 38 weeks if the fetus is breech position. If the fetus is breech, and you know it, you've confirmed it through ultrasound. So this is something that you can do. This is an ultrasound. This is guided by the ultrasound and you perform this uh, external cephalic version where you just change the position of the fetus from the breech to the cephalic uh, um, position. So it, it is done usually at 37 to 36, 38 weeks. Around 36 to 40 weeks, the fetal head descends in the pelvis, cause, uh, causing lightening. The patient will feel uh, that, uh, you know, patients usually complain about problem in breathing because obviously the, the uh, uterus has grown and is compressing towards the chest and everything. And there's more complaint of epigastric discomfort uh, and those kind of complaints you'll hear, but they get better around 36 to 40 weeks because the fetal head descends, it descends into the pelvis and the patient uh, feels better about, no more feels those kind of complaints. Mild cramping can occur, mild lower extremity edema can occur and frequency are all normal events in the third, third trimester. Of course, the baby weight, the patient is retaining more water and salt, so edema can occur. All those things can happen, and you have to keep counseling the patients regarding these. Then common events, uh, we're going to continue with the complications. Lots of complications can occur, and you have to look for all of these. Uh, these are the premature uh, rupture of membranes, uh, and then the preterm labor and delivery can happen. Placental abruption can happen, and placenta previa, vasa previa, all these conditions, you have to keep an eye on these. You have to keep monitoring blood pressure for preeclampsia. UTIs can happen. Uh, gestational anemia, gestational diabetes, all these conditions uh, can happen. They can complicate uh, a normal pregnancy in the third trimester. Then uh, lastly, this is the thing that you have to do throughout the pregnancy. You have to counsel the pregnancy 
with patient and educate the patient even uh, before, for example, for supplements, you know, folic acid, even before the patient is pregnant, if she just comes to you and says, I'm planning to get pregnant or I want to get pregnant, you just tell her to take uh, folic acid because uh, this is for the prevention of uh, neural tube defects. The folic acid is for the prevention of that. And by the time the patient knows that she's pregnant, that neural tube formation usually happens within four weeks. Like it, it has already happened. So starting uh, folic acid at that time uh, is uh, actually of no use, like not really no use, but it's better if you, if the patient is taking it before she gets pregnant. So you should just give the patient folic acid. Uh, and then vitamin D and iron, very important. Uh, she has to take, if she's, uh, the supplements usually um, are given the maternal uh, the multivitamins, their anti prenatal multivitamins are given, but the most important ones are these, vitamin D, extra vitamin D should be given and iron because um, iron is the only, uh, element that you know it gets deficient the the growing demand cannot be met by uh, diet alone so the supplementation is required especially in the third trimester so nutrition you have to uh, counsel the patient educate her about good nutrition a balanced diet avoiding alcohol avoiding smoking all those things uh, counsel the patient about all those things, the lifestyle habits, smoking, alcohol, caffeine. Uh, counsel her about, tell her about uh, the appropriate uh, amount of uh, uh, caffeine intake. Caffeine intake shouldn't be like one or two cups of coffee if you're taking. No alcohol is safe, as I told you. So zero alcohol during pregnancy. Smoking is bad and should uh, pregnant uh, patient shouldn't be smoking at all. Weight gain, she should be, uh, how much weight gain is good for her and how much she should gain during the pregnancy. A healthy weight gain is necessary. Counsel the patient about her, educate her about these things, educate her about medications, some of the medications that are harmful. Uh, uh, just let the patient know, Tell, educate the patient as much as you can. And safety measures, you know, home safety, seat belt use, you know, while driving, traveling, about the use of, you have to keep reminding the patient about these things, I would say at every visit, because it's very important. So this is it, and um, thank you. I hope you learned something. Thanks. <laughs>